The story of the Santa Barbara Channel is much more than just a story of one geographical location. This uniquely situated body of water has spawned significant developments, thoughts, movements, and hopes that continue to affect Santa Barbara and the rest of the world. The human part of this story begins not just a few hundred years ago with the appearance of European explorers, but with the very first evidence of human presence in all of North and South America. The established theory of human migration to the Americas tells of people migrating across the Bering Straits land bridge. Archaeological finds in the Santa Barbara Channel Islands tell a different story. In 1959, anthropologist Phil Orr was studying the extinct pygmy mammoth on Santa Rosa Island. And Phil was putting in a little road down into Arlington Canyon to kind of facilitate moving his Jeep around on the island. And he got his grader stuck. And he was looking around trying to figure out how to get it from tipping into the canyon and noticed that there was a human femur embedded in the sediments there at the side of the canyon. And he recognized that these were buried in Pleistocene sediments, the same formation in which he'd been finding pygmy mammoth bones. The discovery of Arlington Springs Man is considered even more remarkable because the bones turned out to be older than anyone had guessed. Radiocarbon dating in 1994 put the bones in excess of 13,000 years old. As such, they are some of the oldest human remains ever found in all of the Americas. So the significance of, of finding evidence of people on Santa Rosa Island 13,000 years ago is that it shows that they must have had watercraft. You know, native peoples in their creation stories don't have us coming from the Bering Straits or Alaska or Russia or any of those parts of the world. They have us coming over from the island or in other traditions from the sky or uh, over the mountain or on the other side of the lake. So when we uh, have always been told that we come from this other region in um, Russia, I, I, I like to believe all of the physical evidence that we find through science, the mitochondria, the DNA. But I love uh, also the fact that, you know, there were island people. The discovery of these ancient remains has added strength to a new scientific theory of how the new world was populated. The fact that we have this very early evidence of people on Santa Rosa Island is supporting the idea that at least part of the migration was taking place along the margin of the continent using boats. Because of melting ice from the end of the last ice age, other evidence of human activity from the same time period may be permanently buried beneath the waves. During those low stands of sea level, all the Channel Islands were one big island. The present islands are just the mountaintops. The coasts were much farther out on the mainland also, so that the distance between the islands and the mainland was very small. It was a channel of just a few miles. 13,000 years ago, the sea level was about 200 feet lower than it is today. So our shoreline here in Santa Barbara area was about a mile out to sea from where it is now. So people who were living at that time period, 13,000 years ago, if they were like the Indians that lived later, would have been living along the coast and therefore their places where they were living, their villages and campsites, are now um, submerged under 200 feet of water. It was the first nation of people here, the Chumash, who developed dependable boats to fish and trade in Santa Barbara's waters. We started out in many different types of sea going or water vessels, the Thule boat for instance, which were the Thule reed um, tied up in bundles and put into a little small one-man watercraft. But then later on uh, it was speculated that, you know, the ancestors just thought of another technology adding planks to the top of those Thule reeds and then later discarded the Thule reeds and continued just to use the planks. From the diary of early explorer Sebastian Vizcaino. Rowing so swiftly that they seemed to fly, five Indians came in another canoe, so well constructed and built, 
that since Noah's Ark, a finer and lighter vessel with timbers better made has now been seen. Sebastian Biscaino, 1602. The Tomal uh, did two things. It allowed them to be better at catching more fish, and it allowed them to increase the amount of trade between the islands and the mainland. It was used all the time for fishing especially and for bringing trade goods up and down the coast and over to the islands and back. And it was a, a very active trade system and that was supported and directed by what we now call the Brotherhood of the Tomo or the Brotherhood of the Canoe. Um, and they were, I guess what you could call a guild and um, very specifically organized. Through time, we can see an intensification of use of marine resources here along the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, earlier in time, there was some fishing, some netting of fish, a gathering of shellfish. But beginning about 3,000 years ago, we begin to see in the archeological record uh, increasing sophistication in using the marine environment. We find uh, the first fish hooks begin to appear. We find uh, harpoon parts and about somewhere between a half and two thirds of people who spoke Chumash languages uh, lived in towns that were directly adjacent to the ocean, either along the coast, the mainland coast of Santa Barbara Channel, or out on the Channel Islands. And uh, the largest towns anywhere were in coastal Southern California were here along the Santa Barbara Channel. In 1542, the first Europeans arrived. Juan Cabrillo sailed into the Santa Barbara Channel and was greeted by many hundreds of Chumash who rode out to Cabrillo's ships in their tamals. In his journals, Cabrillo noted the seaworthiness of the tamals and remarked with some astonishment that the chief of the tribe was a woman. Vizcaino was the next European to sail into the channel and was responsible for giving Santa Barbara its name and he was sent up from Mexico along the Baja coast, along the California coast, to look for a safe place for ships to anchor. One of the other things he was supposed to do was apply names using the Catholic liturgical calendar of the saints to the interesting points and harbors that he came across. From Vizcaino's journey, we get San Diego, San Pedro, Sa Santa Catalina Island, San Nicolas Island, the Santa Barbara Channel, and Santa Barbara Island. From Vizcaino's diary, Next morning, we found ourselves hemmed in in between the islands and mainland. Tacking back and forward on the fourth of the said month, we were struck by a heavy northwester with a high sea, and were obliged to take off the bonnets and run with lower sails, so that we became separated from each other. Legend has it that many of the sailors on board grew fearful of the storm and prayed to the patron saint of sailors in distress, St. Barbara. Coincidentally, the date Vizcaino entered the channel was December 4th, the feast day of St. Barbara. The Spanish occupied Chumash territory beginning in 1769. The mission period began soon after, forever changing the Chumash way of life and decimating the population. Even the powerful Brotherhood of the Tamal was affected. In our stories, it talks about um, a group of 30 Tamals that went out. The um, fathers from the San La Parisima mission ordered them to go out to San Miguel. And they were insisting that several canoes be sent out to the islands to bring back the people who would starve there if they stayed there because they weren't supported by the old systems any longer. And they kept saying, no, you can't go out, the conditions are going to be really awful, we'll, you know, we'll die, we'll drown. And they just insisted and were coerced enough to go out. And only two Tamals came back. The Santa Barbara Channel, described in the foreword of Scrap Lundy's book, The California Abalone Industry, as sometimes lonely, sometimes cruel most times benevolent, but always dangerous. You go out, you get away from the problems on land and into the problems that are out in the ocean. Every day the weather's different, every day the, the sea itself is different, the conditions are different, 
And so it's kind of a challenge to go out and, and try to catch fish. And what can happen is the wind comes up very suddenly and the wind waves occur, which are very, very close together and very steep. In fact, they can be uh, shorter in length than the length of the boat, which makes it particularly dicey because you may go down a trough and have the nose of the boat go down and you turn into a submarine. And there's an area called Windy Lane, which is about the first seven, eight miles coming back from Santa Rosa to Santa Cruz because the wind comes down the coast, hits Point Conception, goes out, and then comes back down again. And that's normally the roughest part of the trip. Running to get to the fishing grounds is always an iffy thing. If you can run downhill, it's nice, but most of the time you got to run uphill, and it's a lot nicer to run downhill coming home. But it depends on where you're, where you're going. The potato patch at the uh, west end of Santa Cruz has a heck, heck of a reputation. The current rips through there and the wind blows. You get the current going the wrong direction and, a, and a 30 knots of wind on that, which isn't uncommon in the afternoon. And all of a sudden you're, you're running into waves that are, are breaking on you and th that are uh, 10, 15 foot high when you just come out of a flat area. Throughout its known history, the unpredictability of Santa Barbara's waters has caused more than its share of shipwrecks and near disasters. In September 1854, the Yankee Blade started its trip south from San Francisco. It had about uh, 800 passengers. It also was carrying um, over $150,000 in gold from a San Francisco bank, and in addition to that, uh, more gold from some of the um, lucky gold seekers who had struck it rich in the gold fields. Again, it's the old story. As they approached the Santa Barbara Channel, the captain turned eastward to enter the channel too soon, and the uh, ship ran aground just north of Point Arguello. The seas were very heavy, and the initial uh, attempts to get the um, passengers off in lifeboats ended in disaster, and several of the passengers drowned. The attitude of many is reflected in the quote from the captain of another shipwreck, the Cuba. From the diary of Margaret Eaton, her husband Ira quotes the captain, Young fellow, there is something unknown and sinister in the vicinity of San Miguel. Many times these rocks have taken their toll of ships and men who thought they were on the right course, but found to their sorrow that they were on the wrong one. Other shipwrecks would follow. This would be the story of the Winfield Scott. It, uh, it left San Francisco uh, early in December 1853, headed in south. And on the night of uh, December 2nd, it was approaching Anacapa Island. The ship ended up running into some rocks off of Anacapa Island. Uh, the seas were very heavy, and uh, they couldn't get to the island because they were on the side of the island and had very steep cliffs. So they ended up having to offload the passengers onto some small rocks uh, off of the island. There was panic among the passengers. In fact, at one point, the captain of the ship had to pull his pistol and threaten to shoot people if, if order wasn't restored. And it wasn't until um, about two days later that a rescue ship finally arrived to take the women and children off these small rocks off the island. And then it was another several days after that that the rescue ship returned to take the balance of the passengers off. So those passengers uh, surviving on fish that they could catch. Uh, they caught and killed a couple of seals for seal meat. They had some rough times out there in the days and nights when they were on the rocks off of Anacapa Island. As dangerous as the channel could be, the geography of Santa Barbara, surrounded by mountains and the sea, dictated that whoever came to Santa Barbara invariably came by boat. Pretty much the only way to get to Santa Barbara was by sea. And the steamers would just stop off the shore here, unload the passengers and light cargo, and row them ashore. And that's pretty much the way it was until 1861 when the stagecoach brought people in. But 
that was a miserable way to get here. So pretty much everybody came by sea. You very rarely went by overland, especially in the 1850s and 1860s, because there was desperados and highwaymen along the roadsides, and so that was a very difficult way to come in. Normal circumstances for travel to Santa Barbara by boat were not necessarily drastic, but did provide excitement for those making the journey. The method for disembarking was anything but routine. In his book, Two Years Before the Mast, Richard Henry Dana describes the process in detail. We pulled strongly in, and as soon as we felt that the sea had got hold of us and was carrying us in with the speed of a racehorse, we threw the oars as far from the boat as we could and took hold of the gunwale, ready to spring out and seize her when she struck, the officer using his utmost strength to keep her stern on. We were shot up upon the beach like an arrow from a bow, and seizing the boat, ran her up high and dry. For passengers, there was one other ritual to be aware of. The way that passengers came ashore was the sailors would take you off the boat, put you into a rowboat or a longboat, and roll you ashore. Now the legend is that if you didn't cough up a tip, just as the boat gets to where the waves are starting to really roll and foam, well, it wasn't their fault if the boat would turn sideways and you and your cargo and passengers would just get soaking wet. The new settlers from the East Coast wanted Victorian-style houses instead of adobe. More and more lumber was needed to satisfy Santa Barbara's first building boom and there was no lumber around here. And generally, ships that would unload lumber would just take it offshore, dump it over, and it would float ashore. So you'd be picking up your lumber anywhere from West Beach all the way down to East Beach there. Very inefficient way to get your lumber. This demand for more lumber brought about one of Santa Barbara's most important developments. John Peck Stearns was born in Vermont in 1828, and like so many people, came to California for the gold rush except actually he didn't partake in the gold rush. He taught school, then he studied law, passed the bar exam, and became district attorney up in Santa Cruz County. Inexplicably, with all this knowledge about law and education, he came to Santa Barbara and opened a lumber yard. And actually it was the first lumber mill in Santa Barbara County because there was a bit of a building boom going on uh, in the area at the time. But he was very uh, upset that there was no proper pier or wharf to offload his, his lumber. The following year, in 1868, uh, the Chapala Street Pier opened up, uh, financed by a group of local investors headed up by uh, Dr. Samuel Brinkerhoff. Brinkerhoff uh, Avenue is named after him. But the uh, Chapala Street Pier was only 500 feet long, and so really large boats couldn't tie up to the pier, so you still had the same problem. So that's why Stearns decided, first he offered them uh, to extend the Chapala Street Wharf, and the owner said no. So Stearns then approached Colonel Hollister, our leading citizen, and got a loan from him. He borrowed uh, $41,000 to build his wharf. And uh, by the middle of 1873, Stearns Wharf, 2,100 feet long, which made it the longest pier between um, San Francisco and Los Angeles, was open for business. It just transformed the town. It immediately became one of the commercial hubs of the city. This really opened the door to bring people to Santa Barbara. And once we see that Stearns Wharf is in, ships tie up, passengers come off, and we start seeing a great increase in the hotels in Santa Barbara. And of course, houses now being built out of wood instead of out of adobe. <laughs> By 1873, with the completion of Stern's Wharf using money borrowed from leading citizen William Wells Hollister, Santa Barbara could finally open its doors to the rest of the world. But keeping Stern's Wharf open and in business was not without its challenges. The agreement was Stern's would pay back Hollister $500 a month for seven years. If he missed a payment, the wharf would go to Hollister. Some of the city and government fathers became a little greedy and after a couple of years, they decided to charge Stearns a license fee uh, to operate the wharf. Well, Stearns was you know, pretty upset about this, and uh, Chance sort of uh, took a role in this when in early 1878, a huge storm came through, uh, virtually destroyed the Chapala Street Wharf, parts of which 
uh, then slammed into Stern's wharf, severely damaging and closing down um, the wharf. Stern's refused to repair the wharf uh, unless they, uh, the city fathers um, got rid of the license fee. And so they had a few months of back and forth, back and forth, until finally a coalition of local businessmen went before the government and said, look, Stern's Wharf is just too important to the business of Santa Barbara and the South Coast. Get rid of this license fee, uh, which they did, and Stern's then went ahead, repaired the wharf. And um, it, very soon, again, Stern's Wharf was the commercial center of Santa Barbara. Despite storms, city government interference, damage to the pier, and a huge debt hanging over his head, Stearns never missed a monthly payment. He capped his business success by being elected mayor of Santa Barbara in 1888 and maintained ownership of the wharf until shortly before he passed away in 1902. By the beginning of the 1900s, many changes and developments in industry were in store for Santa Barbara, and the main ones all focused on Santa Barbara's waterfront environment, the expansion of the fishing industry, tourism, and oil. Well, it would be very easy to say that it is Santa Barbara's beachfront that has made the city what it is. The wharf was here, brought people in safely, and then in 1903, a man named Milo Potter opened a beachfront hotel here covering 36 acres. He broke ground January 19, 1902, and said, one year from today, my hotel will be done, and it was. In one year, he built a six and a half story hotel with some 800 rooms in it, all in one year. I don't think he could possibly do that today. But this too put Santa Barbara on the map. The night the Potter Hotel opened, it was said there was more money here than there was in Fort Knox because every family of means was in Santa Barbara. This was the city and the hotel and the place to be. So many of the important and wealthy families came to Santa Barbara, fell in love with it. They came, they saw, they stayed. Many of them moved to Montecito and opened the states there. And they contributed so much to Santa Barbara, Cottage Hospital, our schools, and in fact, our entire beachfront that is now owned by the city is due to these people that came here and fell in love with Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara soon became one of the standard ports of call along the Pacific Coast. In December of 1907, President Theodore Roosevelt sent uh, the U.S. Navy fleet off on an around-the-world trip to sort of show the flag, the American flag, uh, to nations around the world. Of course, by 1907, uh, we had one of the largest fleets in the world, the second largest uh, to Great Britain. And in uh, April of 1908, this great, the Great White Fleet, as it was called, because the hulls were all painted white, dropped anchor off of Santa Barbara. And this was, of course, a, uh, an excuse to have a grand party uh, in the city. It is said that as the officers were enjoying the hospitalities at the upscale Potter Hotel, the rest of the crew members reveled downtown. Everything was going along fine until just before the fleet was getting ready to uh, pull up anchor. Apparently, some of the merchants in town had taken this opportunity to um, really up their prices and a group of sailors uh, going to a restaurant on the Lower State Street uh, took umbrage at this. And even though they paid the bill, they came back later and started to pelt the restaurant with rocks, breaking the windows, trashing the dining room, until order was restored by a combination of the city police and the uh, shore patrol. The latter apparently uh, had to crack some heads with their billy clubs in order to get order restored. Nonetheless, um, it, all in all, it was a great success, and the Great White Fleet uh, pulled up anchor with very fond memories of Santa Barbara. Ironically, the year that Milo Potter broke ground for his hotel was the same year that Santa Barbara witnessed the invention that would ultimately drive the Potter Hotel toward bankruptcy, the automobile. When the use of the automobile became common, people no longer stayed in one location, such as the Potter. They spent perhaps a few days and then moved on. The Potter Hotel was only profitable for a few years, then declined. Fate decided the final ending. From the Diary of Margaret Eaton. The hotel
hotel had other fires, but nothing like this one. The flame shot 200 feet in the air. There was a 40 mile an hour gale blowing from the northeast and we knew the hotel was doomed. All the boats were covered with ashes and cinders. Men were guarding the wharf with wet gunny sacks to beat out small fires. Margaret Eaton, 1921. And luckily it was blowing out to sea because fishermen reported a mile and a half out to sea, live embers were landing on their decks. So fierce was the blaze at the Potter Hotel. Stern's Wharf caught fire a couple of times from the blaze. So the Potter Hotel went down in only about three hours it took to take that magnificent hotel and burn it to the ground. The only evidence that remains of the Potter Hotel today, near a plaque commemorating the Chumash village of Syukdun, is Ambassador Park off Cabrillo Boulevard. The two lines of palm trees mark the entrance to what was once one of California's grandest hotels. Another disaster was to strike close to Santa Barbara just two years later. Yeah, probably the, one of the greatest uh, naval disasters in the Santa Barbara area history was um, the destruction of seven U.S. Navy destroyers in September 1923. The squadron of destroyers had just enjoyed a fleet week up in San Francisco and were steaming back to their home base in San Diego. They were coming down, approaching the uh, Santa Barbara Channel near Point Arguello um, one night. And in those days, navigation by radio was still kind of a, a new thing. Uh, they were still using dead reckonings, celestial navigation, etc. Um, but it was nighttime and it was foggy. So dead reckoning and celestial navigation was, was a very tricky proposition. If you look at a map of California uh, at near Point Aguayo, Point Conception, you see that ships, in order to enter the channel, have to turn um, east to go down the channel because the coast here runs east-west. So the squadron commander on his own initiative told the squadron to make the turn east, thinking he was past Point Arguello, and he wasn't. And so the uh, lead ship, the Delphi, started heading east straight for shore, unknown uh, to them that they were heading for a disaster. And then the Delphi you know, slammed into the rocks near Point Honda, or as we, now it's known, Point Arguello, uh, followed by six of the other ships. My uncle was involved too. There was, there was four, four fishermen with two boats, you know, and they were anchored in. I guess that morning they just heard all this noise over there at, you know, our grill over there. And, uh, so they just, uh, they had skiffs in those days, you know, for lifeboats. They just jumped in the skiffs and went out there and picked them up and rolled them on the beach, you know. They, they picked up 123. 123, yeah, that's it. Now, given that um, seven ships with full crews had shipwrecked, the loss of life was pretty light. 23 uh, sailors lost their lives. Um, over 200 were injured. And um, there were some acts of heroism of, of sailors helping um, each other to shore, to rocks for safety, helping the wounded, the injured, etc. And there were also some lighter moments. Uh, one person apparently, uh, while waiting for rescue, uh, he had a Victrola pho phonograph with him. So he played his records while he was waiting for rescue. Today you can visit the site and there's no sign of any of the ships, um, you know, the wind, the tides, the, the seas have all, have all uh, effectively buried the seven destroyers of, of the Honda disaster. Later in the 1920s, with the advent of Prohibition, Santa Barbara's waters became the scene of another colorful, if not legal, occupation. Well, during Prohibition, Santa Barbara was a delightful pl place for the uh, rum runners, etc. The islands were perfect places for ships to come in, offload their goods and hide them, and then they'd be brought ashore. Many of Santa Barbara's commercial fishermen and others made a good uh, living bringing in these contraband goods. They would bring it up in fast boats these rum runners, as they called them, at, at night, and they would get local fishermen to row it in through the breakers in skips. 
and they brought used they brought it ashore a lot ashore there at uh, Loon Point. Ira took some members of John Barrymore's party out to the boat and showed them through. Their eyes opened when they saw so much good liquor at one time. There were 200 cases of champagne, 400 of Royal Stag whiskey and earthen crocks, and the balance was Hennessy. Toward evening, the Miss Santa Barbara shot out of the bay like lightning on a direct course for the Rincon to unload. Margaret Eaton, 1927. And my dad and I used to surf fish along that stretch of the beach. And uh, he found a sack that had, uh, they'd lost in <laughs> coming ashore. And I remember we took him up to the uh, oh, power shovel or steam shovel, was working there loading asphalt. And a fellow by the name of Cooley ran it. And uh, dad offered him one of these bottles. And Mr. Cooley thought that was just fine. <laughs> My dad uh, didn't drink at that time, but he sure had a lot of friends in Garberia. <laughs> it was during this time that the discussion of a safe harbor for Santa Barbara intensified. However, as with most development in Santa Barbara, there was already history attached to it. The first time that a, um, the idea for a harbor for Santa Barbara was broached was as early as 1850. And during the course of the 1800s, the city would put into the federal government for federal funding from time to time. They always got turned down. Then in the early 1900s, there were a couple um, bond issues put to the voters, uh, and they too were turned down. But then as tourism and recreation became more important to the local economy, the question sort of turned from um, should we have a harbor to where should we put the harbor? There were three main areas discussed. One was the Goleta Slough, the other was where the bird refuge is now, and the final one was where the harbor is today. Well, Goleta was turned down pretty quickly because it's too far away. And ultimately, the bird refuge was turned down, again, because it was felt it was too far away from the central downtown core of Santa Barbara, even though they knew it was going to be a lot cheaper to build a harbor there than where they finally decided to build it. In the early 1920s, sort of to the rescue, wa, uh, came Max Fleischmann, who um, had a couple homes in Montecito, and he was from the, the Fleischmann Yeast Company, so the man had a lot of money. And he had one of the largest yachts in that area and wanted to protect his yacht, the Haida, from the ocean waves. And he said he would put up $200,000 if the city would match it to build a harbor. So the city put up another bond issue, this one passed, and in the mid-1920s, construction began on Santa Barbara Harbor. Now, the original idea for the breakwater was it would be about 800 feet long and parallel to the shore with just a little arm turning towards the shoreline, about 400 feet long. And then what they figured, they might have a little uh, a pier stretching from the shore connecting to that arm so the water could pass through and it would move the sand down along the beach. What happened was the breakwater being offshore slowed the ocean waves coming in and all this sand drifting down the coast started piling up. So immediately, the little harbor they had planned started filling in with sand right off the bat. So then they built the solid piece that took it to shore, and the sand piled up against that and created Leadbetter Beach. If you walk along West Beach and along Leadbetter Beach, take a look at where the City College bleachers are and where the, the cliffs are in the background, and that's where the ocean actually used to hit up along there. Sand accumulation has always been a problem. The literal drift of sand goes down uh, the coast, so the harbor basically stops that drift, and so you have a buildup of sand at the harbor. Meanwhile, beaches um, down below the harbor get denuded of sand. So, for instance, you used to have beautiful beaches at uh, the Biltmore Hotel, further down in Carpinteria. All these have pretty much been washed away over the years because of the Santa Barbara Harbor. Major Max Fleischmann's original deal was he would give $200,000 for the building of the breakwater and the city would match it with another $200,000. But then when, it was put, when the first arm was put in, Fleischmann thought it was too short and so he gave more money to extend it. Then they had to build the arm connecting it to the shoreline. That costs more. So all in all, it cost Fleischmann $550,000 to create the breakwater to make a safe harbor for his boat. The Santa Barbara Harbor was completed in 1930, offering a safe place for Santa Barbara's unique mix of boat craft and lifestyles. It took several years for the harbor to begin to take the shape we see today. 
Well, everything was on moorings. No, no slips at all. Oh, but no, they no, took part of the breakwater and put slips. Then, after, uh, then later on, as, as the years went by, you know, they just extended out more. They figured, well, they could make more money by putting slips in than the guys that were on the moorings. See. There are other working harbors, but, but typically most of the harbors, especially once you get north of Point Conception, are either fishing communities or recreational harbors. This harbor is relatively unique because it's a mixture of both. And it has been for a century. And, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about Santa Barbara Harbor is that it's recognized as a mixed-use harbor. And the working, it's res the working fleet respects the recreational aspect of it and vice versa. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really a very special place. The Santa Barbara Harbor increasingly gained importance in Santa Barbara's maritime activity. However, the transition was a slow one. The central focus for waterfront activity for many years was still Stearns Wharf. Although Stearns Wharf still brought many people to Santa Barbara, it was the railroad that took over as the number one transportation option. However, Stearns Wharf still prospered in the early 1900s. The wharf for many, many years was sort of the commercial center for the city. Beginning in the early 1900s, it changed a bit from um, the commercial and shipping center because, of course, you had the railroad operating by then. It became uh, the center of um, Santa Barbara's fishing industry. The early 1900s was a period when uh, the vessels were just beginning to switch from sail to gasoline and that of course uh, brought about a huge evolution in the fleet where boats were able to go further and stay longer and, and uh, commit more horsepower to their operation and so you saw more productive net fisheries for example, you saw uh, more productive trap fisheries and as the gear continued to get better and better with the evolution of better engines, more powerful engines, uh, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, the development of hydraulics and what have you, and they, really what you saw was the emergence of the modern fisheries we have today. My family, my, my stepdad, uh, Castagnola, Mario Castagnola, and he comes from a fishing family. Uh, his father and uh, uncle came to this country oh, in the 1890s period, and, and uh, started fishing here using old uh, skiffs. One of the biggest uh, fishing industries was uh, the Larco Fishing Company, uh, located on State Street. And they had several boats, uh, and uh, they, their main fishing was uh, a dragging for halibut and sole uh, in the channel. There were a lot more fish, lots of mackerel, bonita, occasionally, uh, Yellowtail would come up, lots of halibut. I was fortunate I got to meet Red Allen and some of the Castagnola guys, Dario. These guys were all, you know, they'd been fishing for ages uh, and, and, and they were willing to talk to you and help you out and tell you, tell you stories. But I, I don't remember who this was, but some guy talking about, oh yeah, man, the albacore used to come in here and we'd catch albacore right off Stern's Wharf. The albacore run had come in that close. He used to go down to Summerlin and throw a, take a line and throw a, put a, a ham bone on it. And the lobsters were so thick, you throw it in the, the wash rocks at Summerlin. A lobster will glomp onto that, won't let go. He just grabs on, and you can pull a lobster out without ever getting in the water and not, or even using a trap. They had lobster camps uh, over on uh, Santa Cruz Island, and uh, the fishermen would actually stay in different coves around the island there and, and shacks that they built and uh, fish certain areas of the beach and rocky areas and do quite well. And then there would be a boat go over maybe a couple of times a week and, and pick up the lobsters uh, uh, from the fishing camps there. Sword fishing was, was a good industry here because we, we didn't use nets or anything like that, but we used to uh, harpoon them. And uh, we'd be out on the, other, on the other side of the island, Santa Cruz Island, uh, looking at the surface of the ocean over to see uh, the fins of the swordfish that would be finning along like this on the surface. And you, you got pretty good at determining if it was a shark or a swordfish. And then with the guy that navigates the boat, you just got to maneuver the boat and keep it behind that fish all the time. But if, if you think you got a good shot at the fish, you just go ahead, take a shot at it and hope to God you hit it. <laughs> Oh, 
Although the Santa Barbara Channel has historically seen abundant marine resources, the development of one particular fishery made Santa Barbara stand out, a fishery first utilized many thousands of years ago. The Chumash Indians uh, gathered a great variety of shellfish, among them abalone. It was an important food source. They used the shell for dishes. They used it for trade. They would uh, take pieces of the shell and actually use it for their, their currency, their money. And they were traded up and down the coast and all the way, you know, there was a very complex trading system in the United States before European contact. So that you find shells and also the um, asphaltum that comes from here, way inland, among the Pueblo tribes and Navajo tribes, you know, into Texas, everywhere. It's just very widely traded. It was not until the middle of the 1800s that another group of people would again popularize the abalone. Chinese immigrants discovered them in Monterey Bay. And the abalone here, the red abalone there in Monterey was two to three times the size of the abalones in Asia. So that's what started the original industry. Then they were shut down due to the prejudicial laws enacted by Congress. And the Japanese had the same experience in Monterey Bay in 1895-96. The harvesting of abalone also caught on with many in Santa Barbara. In her diary entry of 1905, Margaret Eaton talks about her husband's and their friend's interest in abalone. Ira went to bring Clarence Libby and Frank Nidiver back from San Nicolas Island. They had 1,700 pounds of crawfish, three tons of abalone, and four tons of shell. They had also found some good pearls in the abalone that they could sell for two or three hundred dollars. Abalones brought a good price for the market. They were boiled, dried, and sold to the Chinese who shipped them back to China for food and medicinal purposes. The shells were shipped to Germany and made into jewelry and fancy articles. Margaret Eaton, 1905. Although the fishing community of Santa Barbara saw the value in abalone early on, it took a fortuitous discovery to make the industry really take off. In 1907, a German immigrant chef, uh, Pops Dolder, in Monterey discovered that if you sliced abalone, pounded it to make it uh, chewable, and quickly deep fried it with an egg and a crusty batter, you had something that people would actually break the doors down to get to. In the ensuing years, abalone became an increasingly popular delicacy, and the demand for it launched one of this country's most colorful, long-lived, and interesting industries. The abalone industry in Santa Barbara got started uh, by accident in March of, earlier of 1943, because all the ab divers from Morro Bay had gone to Newport Beach to dive for uh, a grassy substance that was on the bottom called agar agar. And that had formerly come from, 90% of it had come from Japan, which was cut off, of course, because of the war. And this was a medicinal item, so it was badly needed for the war effort. Well, it was tough diving because you had to go down and pull this stuff up off the bottom by hand. And two divers from Morro Bay, Frank Brebs and Charlie Pierce, decided they'd had enough of that, so they got on their boat and were coming back to Morro Bay to dive for abalone when they stopped in Santa Barbara for the night. Well, at that time, the islands offshore here were closed to abalone diving. And uh, rumor has it that they knew possibly firsthand that there were a lot of abalones out there. So the two of them made a trip to San Miguel and came back with a big load. And they called their brother Dutch Pierce in Morro Bay, said, send the truck down. And that happened a couple days in a row. And they said, uh, we can do it without driving back and forth. And they set up their processing shop on the end of Stern's Wharf and they would take a pleasure boat 30 to 35 feet long, a wooden boat, and put an air compressor on it and make that into a dive boat. And they were about eight or nine knot specials. And the boats were still pretty slow, and so we used to stay out there, you know, typical trips for three days, and sometimes with a pickup boat, you could stay out for two, three weeks. The guys down at Clemente and stuff, hell, they might stay out for a month. There were guys out there writing books while they were out at the islands and doing all sorts of stuff. Then Ron Radden developed the Radden boat 
in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. And that was a true uh, technological event because it allowed the divers to get away from the bad weather quickly and to get out and back quickly. And it allowed them to be more, far more efficient harvesting. And they're the boat that's still used today. With the heavy gear, that is the old fashioned deep sea diving suit, the diver had to be supported by two or three men on, on the boat. And he would go down to the bottom and it was a diving method called live boating because the boat was not anchored. And the boat would follow the diver's bubbles across the bottom. You work hard, you sweat, but you're, you feel like a, at the end of the day, you've worked out physically hard. To be an abalone diver doesn't take uh, what color you are, how big you are, what sex you are. It just takes having, getting underwater and picking them and putting them in a bag and sending them up. That's the beauty of it. It's just personally what you can do. Having the islands offshore was a unique thing because on the coast, if you're diving on a coastline, say in Morro Bay or here, if the weather's bad, you're out of business because it's bad everywhere on the coast. Whereas at the islands, it can be bad at one island and you can move to another one and find some safe water to dive in. And they start work early in the morning. The diver would get what's called dressed in on the boat, which would take 15 minutes to get all the gear on. And then he go to work. And the water temperature could be from say 50s to the low 60s. And he wore, uh, in the old days, several suits of woolen underwear to stay warm or in the more modern days, a wetsuit. And they stayed down most of the day. And they'd move spots, change spots constantly, looking for uh, new supplies of abalone. This was one of California's longest standing industries. 144 years, which puts, puts it up there with cattle ranching, uh, saloons, brothels, and um, dry goods stores. So it's an extremely interesting time in California's history. And the people involved were just incredibly interesting uh, by the very nature. I mean, you couldn't be in the business and not be interesting. A bunch of crazy, uh, wild, uh, hard drinking, hard fighting uh, guys that hit the beach, spent all the money, chased the girls, and the whole nine yards. And, uh, they did it for the quick money and the uh, time off and the, they like to work in the ocean. We used to get caught in the weather, we'd run out, the weather would come up and we might, we might sit there for three, four days. Sometimes it took so long for the weather to get to where you could move that we just all side tie, play cards, get drunk and eat up all the food. <laughs> And by the time the, the three, four, five days were up, all right, let's go home and <laughs> stock up and try again. <laughs> Their actions in bars were just legendary. There was a bar in Avila Beach in the 40s and 50s. It was the only bar in the state that had a standing order with the local glass company to come in and replace the front window every Monday morning. It's an industry you can never, as a group, can never be repeated. Like barnstorming pilots can't come back for a lot of reasons. And the same is true here. So they were a very colorful, hardworking, brave group. It was this same group of rugged individualists that revolutionized another industry, taking it from the Santa Barbara coast to prominence worldwide. From the abalone divers in the 50s, 1950s, came most of the significant developments in commercial diving. And by that I mean the development of diving helmets that are still used today, came from Kirby and Morgan, former abalone divers, and saturation helium oxygen systems for deep diving that's used today came from Dan Wilson, who was an abalone diver here in the uh, 50s. So the abalone diving made a tremendous impact or contribution towards diving worldwide. The oil companies knew that they had vast reserves waiting beyond 200 feet of water. They knew that the oil and gas was out there, but they couldn't get to it because they couldn't have the diving support. They were technologically at a standstill.
1962, one of the local abalone divers here in Santa Barbara by the name of Dan Wilson decided that he was going to prove to the oil and gas industry that divers could dive beyond 250 feet using what's called oxyhelium. It's basically taking the nitrogen, which induces this narcotic effect to the diver, and he removed it from the air. So November 3rd, 1962, and they went out to the east end of Santa Cruz Island, and he made a dive to 400 plus feet of water to demonstrate that he could do this. And he got worried about this. He thought, gee, I'm gonna get down there and I'm gonna get real cold. So I'm gonna put on a wetsuit. That way, if I get a leak, it won't matter, I'll be all right. He didn't realize that a wetsuit would compress in those depths to the point where it had absolutely no thermal qualities whatsoever. So he made the dive, and when they finally got him up, he was so, so cold that he, could not, he couldn't talk. And he didn't die, but he came very close to it. It was quite a remarkable time because all of a sudden, new companies were being formed using this oxyhelium. Uh, Navy divers who had been using it in the Navy, they suddenly transitioned into the commercial arena. When we first uh, brought our helium equipment into the offshore environment, the competitive company, the big company, associated divers who were making a fortune out there having a monopoly who didn't want any competition uh, told the oil industry that this new crazy group would kill themselves in their first uh, few dives that because once we proved it did work and was very safe and very effective we put them out of business so all these diving companies started to form and they soon found out, hey, we're going to deeper water and there's a, a lot of time needing to be spent in the water. So Danny Wilson decided, hey, I, I'm going to invent a diving bell to act sort of as an underwater elevator to help the diver transit to and from the work site. And uh, back in the mid 60s, he introduced the diving bell called the Purisma. It was built here in Santa Barbara. It was tested here in Santa Barbara. Technologically, it was a bit of a, a bit of a, a nightmare, but nonetheless, it formed the basis for the rest of the refinements of diving bells, which soon took place in the commercial diving industry. Over the years, the Santa Barbara waterfront has seen a great share of innovative individuals from the early Chumash to John Stearns, to innovations in diving by Lad Handelman, Bob Kirby, Bev Morgan, to Ron Radden and many others. If I could have a time machine and sit in one place in Santa Barbara and watch the time pass by, it would be right down here. We have you know, the hide and towel trade, we have the Stern's Wharf, the Chapala Street Wharf, the Breakwater, the Harbor, and also early aviation. The history of the Lockheed Aviation Company is right here in Santa Barbara. Malcolm Lockheed and his brother Alan started building seaplanes, and there was a ramp right over by between Chapala and Bath Streets where they would launch their seaplanes right out here. During World War II, Stern's Wharf was used by the U.S. Navy. The fisheries in the channel remained active. Where there was some uh, major army camps like Camp Cook and San Luis Obispo, uh, Camp Roberts, and we used to sell uh, fish to them quite a bit, plus uh, the Tri-County area uh, markets and restaurants. So we had trucks that would um, deliver fish to them a couple of times a week. One, be calm. Two, get under shelter. Don't run. Obey your air raid warden. Although there was a strong military presence in Santa Barbara during the war, it was a completely unexpected event that brought notoriety to Santa Barbara's war efforts. In uh, February uh, 1942, uh, Japanese submarines surfaced off of the Elwood oil fields just beyond Goleta. Just a little after 7 o'clock, when President Roosevelt was beginning his fireside chat, they launched about a half a dozen to a dozen shells from their deck gun at the Elwood oil facilities. And fortunately, uh, their aim was re really quite bad. Uh, there was virtually no damage done to the oil fields. The submarine sank back under the waves and uh, took off for Northern California. 
Well, as you can imagine, though, especially in that time of the war, it was shortly after Pearl Harbor, uh, it created quite a bit of panic. <laughs> that really opened up people's eyes that this could happen anywhere. And that also helped lead to the roundup of the Japanese American civilians and removing them to the concentration or relocation camps. That attack fed the, um, the paranoia, the fear of possibly a major Japanese attack occurring in California. And it was the first attack on the mainland uh, United States uh, since uh, the War of 1812. <laughs> As time moves forward, the love that Santa Barbara has for its ocean environment is perhaps still reflected most deeply by those who draw their livelihood from it. We always felt uh, in the abalone business we were the caretakers of the islands. And I think we were for years. No one was out there except for the uh, ranchers and, and the abalone divers. We knew what was going on. It wasn't part of my uh, thinking at that time to appreciate its beauty and the marine animals and the, uh, the colors. Uh, later on I came to, to learn that. I'm thinking of an experience where we were diving in real shallow one day doing urchins and, and it's, it's a rainy day. I get in the water, it's 10 feet, only 10 feet deep. And I'm looking up and watching the rain hitting the water. I'm, watch, I'm diving shallow enough that I can see the rain splashing. Only time in my life I ever had this happen. To me it was an honest, honest way to make a living. And it still is. By the end of the 1960s, Santa Barbara seemed ready for any challenges that might come its way. What happened next would test the limits of knowledge, activism, insights, and innovation, not only in Santa Barbara, but around the world. The decade of the 1960s was about to challenge Santa Barbara's maritime environment in ways that few ever imagined. But before those events came to pass, a new worldwide phenomenon was taking place that again found Santa Barbara uniquely situated to take advantage of. It was a culture, a way of life, and an ocean awareness that featured an entirely different kind of watercraft. Surfing was introduced to California in 1907 by George Frith as a demo in Redondo Beach. And then everybody's going, wow, look at this guy standing up on a board, da da da. And you know, it's picked up a lot of news. And you know, people would see the boards, they go, well, well let's just make one. And uh, like the picture of, that uh, Dwight Falding took in 1910 of the kid down here at uh, at Stern's Wharf, it's just there, you know, it's, it's pointy at one end and it's wood, it floats a little bit, and you get into a wave and you can move on it. So look, I'm surfing. The first written record of Santa Barbara's surfing may have been in 1916 from one of Santa Barbara's earliest surfers, a girl, then 12 years old. From the diary of Sally Gaines. Our mother kept her promise that when we were old enough, we could try surfing. At 9, 10, and 12, she thought we were ready. She described again how the boys at Waikiki Beach had ridden their boards over the waves. Sally Gaines's mother commissioned a local carpenter to create the first three surfboards ever manufactured in Santa Barbara. Mother drove us down to the bathhouse, and from there we carried our boards up the beach past Castle Rock. Sometimes we were able to ride all the way to the beach. Sally Gaines, 1916. In 1917, Gardner Green Hammond, uh, who owned a place down here called Bonnie Mead, which is now the Biltmore area, uh, commis said, commissioned his carpenters. He said, I want a sailboat, a canoe, and a surfboard. So in 1917, this is the configuration they came up with. Some of the earliest Hawaiian boards were up to 26 feet long. They were made out of coal wood, and it's sort of a joke that it was the sport of kings, which it was, but the king could say, you five guys, take my board down to the beach, because it probably weighed 300 pounds. Like Rennie Yader said, we asked him when he started surfing, he said, 
I didn't start surfing till I was 17. And we go, what? He says, well, I couldn't carry the board. So that was back in the sl you know, the plank days when the board, I mean, it weighed 100 pounds. So it was a chore. It was in the late 1950s that the sport of surfing became popularized with the advent of the first surf-themed movies such as Gidget in 1959. However, Santa Barbara remained relatively undiscovered as a surfing destination until much later. The first time I came up to Santa Barbara, it was the fall of 1960. There was only a, uh, a handful of surfers in Santa Barbara at the time. I mean, it was very uncrowded. A few hundred surfers. I mean, all the surfers are in Southern California. It was incredible, especially the Gaviota Coast. Uh, you know, uh, just going up there, ex uh, discovering spots, naming spots. Nobody there. I mean, with no leash, no wetsuit. I mean, <laughs> surfing was pretty, pretty rugged sport back then. You really had to really know the ocean as, uh, you know, intimately to really be a part of it. As people's surfing preferences and styles changed, the evolution of the surfboard kept pace. Well, the first surfboard maker in Santa Barbara was Tom Rowland. That was around 1957. And he made balsa boards uh, locally. Then Rennie Yainer came up in 59 and started you know, his, his shop. And after he'd made, you know, boards for everybody in town, he was sort of done because everybody had a board, so he went off and commercial fished. And then in the mid-60s, uh, Michael Cundeth started making boards. And then George Greeno, who was not per se a board maker, but a fin designer, came up with some fantastic modern fin designs. And uh, he also was uh, the first person to film and to make a movie inside the tube. Well, the Gaviota Coast is, is a world-class coast. I've been all over the world. I've, I've searched other places. And it is as good as any coast there is in the world when it's going off. You've probably got 15 world-class point breaks going off at one time from Point Conception down to Rincon. I mean, it is pretty incredible. It was this pristine coastline that showcased Santa Barbara's uncrowded surfing, thriving fishing industry, an optimistic outlook at the end of the 1960s. Business along Santa Barbara's waterfront was a mixture of commercial fishing, abalone divers, and oil. When I came here, Stern's Wharf uh, was different. On the end of the wharf, there was a, an abalone processing shop. There were fuel docks. And there was a, it was a beehive of activity with cranes unloading uh, oil field equipment onto barges, and it was an industrial port. And Santa Barbara was a more of a fishing uh, town, an industrial town, and proud of it. And the people in those jobs were proud of their jobs and respected in the community. This is all pre-1969 when the oil spill hit. the Santa Barbara oil spill, an event that would not only change and broaden people's environmental awareness locally, but would also have repercussions that were felt all over the world. Well, I was at my desk at the News Press, January 29th, 1969. A call came in and I, it was a male who didn't identify himself. He said, the ocean is boiling around Platform A. That was the platform that, the Union Oil platform that blew out. Well, one day we had an indication where oil was going to come in on the beach, and it was near downtown, one of the beaches. And so a number of us went down and waited for it. 
And we stood there and we heard and saw the waves crashing on the beach, as, as usual. And then all of a sudden, the waves didn't break. It was just a swell. The oil was coming in and it was holding the wave, the water intact, and preventing uh, the waves from breaking. So it just came in a wave on the beach, silent. All of a sudden, you couldn't hear the waves breaking. You weren't even aware of the noise until it disappeared. The well on Platform A was plugged after 11 days, but oil continued to surge to the surface for more than a year afterwards. Estimates of the amount of oil spilled range from 18,500 barrels to 780,000 barrels. The Coast Guard selected the round number of 100,000 barrels. How much marine life perished, no one knows for certain. Only the animals that drifted on shore could be counted, not the ones that sank, were buried, or washed out to sea. The California Department of Fish and Game reported that 3,600 birds had died. Of the 1,500 seabirds that citizens volunteered to clean at a waterfront station, only 168 survived. Referred to often as the environmental shot heard round the world, the Santa Barbara oil spill for many signifies the birth of the modern environmental movement. I got calls almost every day from media all over the world, from Asia to, to, uh, to London. Uh, the news press came to be known as the best source of information rather than going to public agencies or the oil industry. They called me. Reactions to the oil spill reached the highest levels of government. Within a year, the Environmental Protection Agency was formed in 1970. The Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act following shortly thereafter. In California, the state Senate reacted severely against the oil industry. In 1969 and again in 1970, legislation passed that would have banned automobiles that relied on internal combustion engines. The bills were never signed into law. The blowout caused a near halt to any new oil production or development in the Santa Barbara Channel. Physically, these changes were reflected in the further deterioration of what is now Santa Barbara's top tourist attraction. Stern's Wharf uh, was always in need of repair quite a bit because it had been neglected for years and years and the old piling were just gradually getting eaten away. And The fire had occurred out in the Harbor Restaurant in 1973 and by, uh, by the mid-70s after the fire of the, of the Harbor Restaurant, the wharf had pretty much gone into decay. They kept it open for about a year. People would walk out here, but the, the wharf pilings were in such bad shape, the, the wood was in such bad shape, they finally just chain-linked off the, the bottom of the wharf. Two proposals emerged for the renovation of the wharf. The first was to increase the commercial space available on the wharf from 25,000 square feet to 90,000 square feet, making Stern's Wharf very similar to Pier 39 in San Francisco. They thought that um, if you didn't have enough restaurants, people wouldn't walk out here just to go see the ocean. And I think the one thing that we argued and has been proven true was that people wanted an ocean experience. People described this as a plank park. They wanted to come out and experience seeing the whole waterfront, seeing the city from the waterfront. If you walk out on Pier 39 in San Francisco, you literally see a wall of buildings and that's all you see is just wood. You don't see, this, you don't see the city, you don't see the ocean. And people go out there and they walk around and they see a bunch of buildings and they turn around and they walk away. The other proposal for the future of Stern's Wharf was even more drastic. There were some council members who just wanted to tear it down. They, they decided that we should just completely get rid of it because it was completely falling in the ocean. You couldn't really walk out here anymore because half of the wharf was gone. And um, they wanted to build a, essentially an extension of the breakwater. There'd be a rock key out here and essentially it would close off the whole waterfront, much like Marina del Rey. And our idea was to take it back to the day of the fire when there was 22,000 square feet of development and just essentially going for a fire rebuild. The process for the renovation of Stern's Wharf has been used as a model for many types of redevelopment for other communities who see the value in its unique blend of an economic model combined with the heart of the community. It's the culture of Santa Barbara that helped make this happen. I mean, we have a civic infrastructure here of people being involved in everything. 
And uh, you add that with the right time, which was right after the oil spill, and those, all of those things combined made it happen. While many ecological and environmental efforts after the oil spill took place on the mainland, there was another citizen-led effort that had to do directly with the Channel Islands and the waters surrounding it. I think the community really started to think about, you know, if this kind of big oil spill can happen here, what can we do to better take care of this place and the, the wildlife that lives in this environment? Um, so that, that was one event. This, the second thing that happened right around the same time was the um, DDT, which is a, a type of a pesticide um, that ha has made its way into the marine environment, um, is something that gets concentrated as it moves up the food chain. And the DDT had a very big impact on the pelican population. And the um, Anacapa Island is one of the most important areas for pelican breeding and nesting on the west coast. And in 1970, there was only one successful um, chick that hatched um, on Anacapa Island. And so I think that was the start of people's thinking in terms of setting this area aside as a national marine sanctuary. This particular region, or what some refer to as a bioregion, is one of the top 15 hotspots for threatened biodiversity in the world. So highly rich in diversity. And one reason it's rich in bio biological diversity is this transitional character. The marriage of mountains, foothills, creeks, wetlands, channel and the islands. You've got cold water coming down from the north, coming into the channel, and it hits Point Conception and starts upwelling. And it, that's why the water isn't clear here. You've got this incredible upwelling, nutrient-rich, cold, deep water bathing these islands. And what that does is bring nutrients up so phytoplankton can thrive and phytoplankton grows like crazy, which is why the water's green. Now there are a lot of little creatures eating that phytoplankton, small, you know, larger creatures eating the little creatures, on and on and on. You've got an enormous food chain ending with blue whales. We have one of the largest population of blue whales anywhere in the world, right out here every summer. It's extraordinary. There's a place in the channel near Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa Islands where there's a, a steep drop-off and the whales seem to congregate around that drop-off area. It seems to be a really good feeding zone for them. Uh, we think because of the upwelling and currents in that area that there's a huge abundance of krill. And both the blue whales and the humpback whales seem to really enjoy coming here. And so we're lucky that that area is accessible by boat and um, we're able to get out there and observe them. After several years of citizen-led efforts, both the Channel Islands National Park and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary were officially recognized in 1980. Congress recognized this area as being a very, the Channel Islands as being a very important and unique place. The sanctuary encompasses the ocean habitat that extends from the mean high tide line out to six, about six miles around the northern Channel Islands which are San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, Anacapa, and then also Santa Barbara Island down south. And the entire area that the sanctuary covers is about 1,500 square miles. We're blessed with an unbelievable channel. Between the Channel Islands out there, 26 miles out, and then the shoreline is this, this, this highway of creatures that is unique. I mean, you've heard, yeah, well, this is the, you know, Galapagos of America. Or, I mean, a lot of uh, analogies and tags have been put on this, and it's for a good reason, actually. It is incredibly diverse. One of the most important goals of the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and managing this area is to encourage lots of uses to allow people to work out there, to play out there, and scuba diving, and swimming, and snorkeling, and surfing, and all of the other activities. So the goal of the sanctuary is, is to balance the multiple different kinds of uses of the sanctuary in a way that is compatible with protecting the marine sanctuary for the long term. Threats to the marine environment are not limited to shipping or oil spills. By the 1990s, it became apparent that the biggest threat to the health of the Santa Barbara Channel was much closer to home. 
Urban development has definitely impacted our oceans. There's been a lot more focus and attention on watersheds and how activities that occur on land actually have negative impacts on our oceans. This can be in the shape of pollution and runoff that is occurring, also habitat destruction um, that occurs with development. The Santa Barbara Channel has always been a special place just, you know, for my own personal enjoyment, the beaches, everything about it, the diving at the island. And so when the beaches started closing, having gone to the beach every day just for solace, I saw these closed beach signs and I was outraged. We were getting phone calls and phone calls of people getting sick all the time from the ocean. And this is when it was mostly because it was the end of a drought era and most of our runoff was really just in the, the winter time. And so the, the, the elected officials weren't paying attention to us. They were going, oh, it's just those surfers are getting sick because they're going in the ocean when they shouldn't be. And so I went back into my research but when I was a reporter and took those facts and called up everybody that was involved in that research and asked further questions. And I turned in a manuscript that was 23 pages long and it filled two whole pages of the newsprint. And, and it really came from my heart and my last words were, can we change this? It's my prayer. Yeah, I think it was about 98, 97, 98, we had major rain and rain late in the year and we were having water, water beach closures at, that persisted into the summertime. And so then we had the hotels where it couldn't allow, they were telling their, their constituents to not swim in the ocean because the water was dirty and it was closed. And that's when things really hit the fan. There was a saying in the 50s, the solution to pollution is dilution. Just put it in the ocean and it will just dissolve and go away. Well, the ocean, when you have signs going up like this, some of them permanently anchored in the sand, the ocean is saying, I can't take it anymore. I, I can't handle all this. The islands are gonna be a and are affected by the terrestrial inputs and the pollutants and the water quality and the general health of our coastal watersheds. Plumes of pollution or sediment reach the islands from Santa Clara or Ventura River. And that speaks to that connection between the, the coastal and the marine environment. As we continue on into the second millennium, the day-to-day -day knowledge of those who work the channel is becoming increasingly important as we seek a balance between sustaining our resources and exploiting them. There's now a collaboration going on between fishermen and scientists that I think is a relatively recent development and really encouraging because nobody, and I defy a scientist to prove me wrong on this, nobody knows more about what's going on out there than the fisherman that spends all day every day out there. Actually, the, the people that manage the fishery have found it's better to hire fishermen to go do the research than it is to hire some yacht or some research boat. It costs too much money and they don't know what they're doing and the fishermen know what they're doing and they're coming up with a lot better uh, results out of that. I think we're entering a whole new era of, of, of uh, reconciliation and working together with the various agencies and the fishermen and the biologists all working toward common goals of biodiversity and sustainable fisheries. I think there was a, a period during which everybody had to sort of let their guard down and, and realize that we need to work together for common goals. I think we're entering that era. I think there's every reason to be very optimistic. Much of the seafood in supermarkets in the United States comes from countries where the fisheries are unregulated or poorly regulated, both in terms of overfishing and problems with pollution. Foreign competition has greatly impacted our local fisheries. We see a lot of product coming in that is at much lower costs that the public are supporting. 
These fisheries, however, often are not highly regulated like our local fisheries are. They don't have the high overhead and uh, operating costs that occur with our local fisheries either. Thus, they can supply fish at a much reduced cost, even though they may not be harvesting it in an ecologically sound manner. In Santa Barbara, the commercial fishing, I would say, is a, a dying breed. I'd say that, that maybe the last generation that's fishing is now fishing, and except there could be an exception of a handful or less than a handful of people, but if you look around the harbor, the lobster fishermen, the average age in California of a lobster fisherman, I think, is about 54 years old now and the average age of urchin divers, which was a young man's fishery, I'd say those guys are 45 to 50 years old, most of them. Other fisheries like uh, I do, you're, you're looking at people up into their 70s, 60s and 70s. You're not looking at people 18 to 30, very few of them. If people are interested in supporting sustainable fisheries and fishing communities, they really should think about buying local products. And again, these aren't necessarily available at their supermarkets, but if they go down to the harbor on Saturday mornings, they can uh, find all the different types of fish products that we have in this area. When you get rid of all the fishing, uh, fishermen in the United States, all you, where are you gonna get your fish? You're not gonna be eating fresh local fish anymore. You're gonna be eating farm fish. You're gonna be eating imported fish from other countries that don't have the laws that we have to preserve our fish. Right now there's a perception that our fisheries are in trouble and locally that's really not true. So in terms of fishery resources, uh, the Santa Barbara Channel appears to look fairly healthy. We do have some species we are concerned about still that require some rebuilding, such as abalone and some of the rockfish species. But there are many species that have recovered to sustainable levels as well as many others that have um, maintained consistent levels for many years. We've just got an unbelievably diverse channel uh, that, that I think everybody wants to see stay that way. Tommy Kern and I were out at the sandbar. It was probably four to five feet, not very big, but it was like it was going in slow motion. And you could get in the barrel and you could just sort of lean back and get just completely in the tube. You could get a, a barrel right all the way to the end. And it just, it's hard to explain. I mean, it was just the ultimate. It's a little bit of a mystery, and I think people want to find out more. And I, you know, people see beautiful pictures of underwater ocean environments and kelp forests and coral reefs, and, and it, it, it's a little unknown and a little scary, but I think you want to find out more somehow. You just want to, want to immerse yourself in this underwater realm. And I, I think oceans, from a, both a fishing perspective and a surfing or a sailing perspective, is a place where you, you can uh, contemplate uh, your connection to the coastal marine system in very intimate ways. The ocean is really part of all of us and it's, it's in you know, our blood, our sweat, our tears, you know, our bodies are the same chemistry is the ocean, we came from the sea. Whether you go to the beach and look out and, and, and meditate, or whether you lay out in the sand and, and get some rays, or whether you go home and eat a swordfish dinner, um, it's, it's, it's part of this, this world and, and it's something that we need to cherish and take care of. I believe it's true that the place where people live, especially as indigenous people, is what forms their culture and what forms their spirituality. And that's necessary because you have to learn how to live there. And so you have to be intimate with everything that is there. So in that way, it, is, it just seems to be part of our genetic memory, if you will, that we really can't be without being near the ocean.